Verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. The Bible says that they ate their meat with gladness in singleness of heart. As a Christian, as many of us are here, it is our calling to both fellowship with one another, and that's coming together, and to spread the gospel message to this world is what we're talking about in world missions. But how can we effectively, is the question, how can we effectively use our fellowship to advance God's kingdom in this global scale around the world? So today I want to talk about a little bit about the fellowship in global missions. We're talking about world missions and how we can empower us, it can empower us to fulfill our mission as believers. And in these few messages, we're going to talk about three important things. We'll talk about the importance of biblical fellowship. That's what we're having, and this is what we're doing here today, coming together and worshiping God. We'll talk about the importance of biblical global missions. Why are we a mission-minded church? And then we'll talk about the results of fellowship and missions together. What is the result of each and one of these? Now, each one of these plays a different aspect and gives us a different result in the church when we continue in one accord. Somebody a while back had shared with me a, a, a dad joke. You know those types of jokes that only the older folks laugh and the young people look at them and say, well, that was not too funny. And they asked the question, they said, what kind of car did the uh, apostles drive? Anybody know that answer? A Honda Accord, because they were all in one Accord. Um, so, yeah, you see the young people are like, oh, Lord, seriously, not too funny, but. I thought it was funny, bro. You thought it was funny, huh, brother? Yeah, okay. Well, that's good, as long as he approves. Now, as we begin, uh, we'll see how the Holy Spirit began to work in the church in such a way that when the church allowed God to work, it brought about results. And that's what we're talking about today. When we allow God to work in us, God will bring results. It may not come at that precise moment, but God's answer will come on his time and in his timing. Now, not just spiritual results, but also tangible results, results that you and I can be witnesses of, you and I can touch, you and I can live them out. When God's timing comes, that's when we allow him to begin to move. So the importance of Biblical fellowship of what we're doing here today. A while back, I was speaking to our presiding bishop, and I said to him, you know, my wife and I, we, we went to a few activities in Zion Assembly, and we wanted to test the spirits. And when we say test the spirits, in other words, we wanted to see what kind of people were the Zion Assembly people. And we went to one event, and we felt the good spirit. And then we went to another area, and we felt the same spirit. And then we went to another, it was the same spirit. And I said, man, I said, it's the same spirit anywhere you go. In other words, the same treatment, the same genuine love you feel everywhere. And the presiding bishop was saying, well, it's not just about that, but it's the brotherhood that exists and must exist in the church. What does that mean? That we must be uh, binded together, we must be molded together in the church so much that nothing can separate the love that you and I have for each other. What type of love is that? It's a type of love that we're going to be speaking about here today. It's the type of love that the Bible says that daily they were in one accord. In other words, they agreed in the spiritual things of God. Daily they were in the temple. Now, you know, in the United States, it's a lot different from the mission field. You know, I've been to various countries in Central America, and one of the things that I've noticed is that life in Central America in these countries is a lot slower than where we live. And I can just talk about Smyrna. Smyrna is a, is a place that's always busy. And in these countries, life is slow. And I told somebody, I said, well, what do y'all do all the time here? He said, we go to church. I said, y'all have church Wednesdays or Sundays? They said, no, we got church every day. 
They go to church every day. And you think about that, and you think about the apostles here, and it says that there were one accord and a breaking of bread. In other words, of coming together. What's the best thing that we can do when we come together is what? Eat. That's the best thing, right? When we come together and we eat. And what did the apostles do? They were one accord. They came together. They broke bread from house to house, and they ate their meat. So I'm sorry for those that are vegan or vegetarians, but they ate meat. And they ate it with what? With gladness. And then I love this word, with a singleness of heart. What does that mean? That there was in two or three hearts in this picture, there was one single heart that brought them together. They were the same. They were cut out from the same cloth. They walked the same. They talked the same. Everywhere you went, you knew these were people of God. Now, the importance of that is extremely important in biblical fellowship when we talk about missions. The Bible says that they continue daily with one accord in the temple. That's Acts chapter 2, and that's going to be found in verse 46. Now, before we get to this, we want to understand what's going on in the book of Acts in chapter 2. In the book of Acts in chapter 1, we see that the Holy Ghost had come upon them, and God had filled them up, and then you'll see it in, in chapter 2 where we call it the day of Pentecost. And they were waiting in the upper room until God gave them the power that they needed in order to go out and reach the world. As soon as this happens, the Bible says that the people that were looking around in that area when the day of Pentecost came, they said it was around 9 o'clock in the morning, and they said, these people are drunk. Because they saw them shouting and speaking in tongues and speaking in different languages that those that had come to visit in the area were able to understand the gospel. And they said, well, what's going on here? And Peter, being the outspoken one that he is, gets up and he begins to speak words, not his own words, but the words that were inspired and were given to him by the Holy Ghost. I, I, I can imagine Peter getting up and speaking the word of God to these people and being reminded by God everything that he had learned in those three and a half years under Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important. Sometimes people say, well, you know, if you're going to take a test when you're in high school, say, take a test, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to remind you, to help you in the exam. And I told a young person, I said, that's true, but if you didn't study, he ain't going to remind you nothing. So study so he can remind you. But Peter gets up and he speaks the word of God and he speaks to them freely. And God's power was so great that look at what Acts chapter 2 verse 37 says. That when they heard this, the Bible says that they were pricked in their heart. And we'll talk about that word prick. We'll talk about what it means. So the Holy Ghost comes down in chapter 2. It's poured out on them in the early church. And a major event takes place here. Being moved by the Holy Ghost, Peter begins to speak the truth to those present. This sermon, as we know, led to 3,000 people joining the church at that time. Can you imagine if we had a revival in this area and 3,000 people, we wouldn't even fit in this building. We'd have to look for something else. Has God changed? He's the same God. God is still the same God. He can still do it today. All he's asking is for us to believe in it. Now, Acts verse 37, Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. The English Standard Version says that when they heard this, they were cut in their heart. Now, if we were to go to the Greek word and look for that word cut, it means pierced or stabbed. You say, how violent is that scripture? No, how violent it was. How surprising it was when they heard the gospel message that the Holy Ghost brought a conviction upon them so strong that it pierced their heart. You ever, you ever felt that before in, in a situation or an event in your life where you feel like your, your heart just drops? That's how they felt. 
They felt pierced in their hearts. They were cut in their hearts because it was the conviction of God showing them at that moment that they were sinners, that they needed a redeemer. They needed somebody to help them. And what was their question? Peter, they said, what shall we do? What are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this pain that we feel? What are we going to do about this, this piercing that we feel in our hearts? It was as if it was a message that was given to them, and all of a sudden it was unexpected. Boom, we just hit him in their hearts, and they said, wait a minute. I feel something here. And they asked Peter. Now when they heard this, the Bible says in verse 37, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? All of this led towards them being repented. And then immediately after they repented, they testified outwardly of what God had done inwardly through what? Through the baptism. And that's what, you know, when we baptize us, it's an outward testimony of what God has done inwardly. Now, I'll, I'll tell you a funny, a funny story here. A few years ago, I was at a Bible seminary, and they were baptizing people. Now, you know, the Bible says that baptism is 100% submerged. you got to submerge of 100%. And boy, I, I was with a young man that had traveled with me from California, and he said, I'm going to get baptized, Nathan. I said, praise the Lord. And he went up there, and this old-time preacher, you remember those old-time preachers that things had to be done exactly the way the Bible says. Amen? You still believe that? Grab them and just, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and baptize him. And when he went down, his toe went up. And the preacher got him back up and said, No, son, we're going to have to do this again. He said, Because the Bible says 100% submerged. And I remember, and he grabbed him again in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and baptized him. And that toe came back up. And I, and I said, I, is he really going to do it? And he got him up and he said, brother, he said, the Bible says 100%. We're going to do this again three times until finally that toe settled into the water. And he said, because it is a witness of what God has done inward. It was serious business. So these people get saved. And the moment they get saved, they said, what shall we do? They get saved. They repent. They're justified by faith. And now what God has done inwardly is expressed outwardly through what? A baptismal service. Can you imagine 3,000 people being baptized that day? That's global missions. That's world missions. Because Peter at that moment saw the opportunity and said, this is my mission field. He got up and said, wait, I got, this is my mission field. I may not be able to go to Central America and go to those areas around the world, go to Africa, but if I can give, can you imagine that offering that I give goes to headquarters and then they print out a track and then that track goes to a hand of somebody and then that person gives it to somebody else in the street and then you know what will happen? Like what happened to my father-in-law? It was a man, he, he, he was in Mexico walking. His life was terrible. He was, you know, he said, I, I didn't know what to do. He had tried all these different religions and he's walking around and all of a sudden he kicks a track on the floor and he picks it up and he says, what is this? And the track said, this is what you need. And he looked at it and it was on Jesus. And he followed the address to the local church and sat in the back and that day he was saved. And he said, this is why I believe in gospel tracts. Isn't that amazing what God can do with that? Now, that track is connected to the person that gave the offering so they can print the track. You see how it's all connected? We're all connected in global missions. And Peter gets up at that moment and he finds it and he says, this is my mission field. I'm going to preach to them the gospel. And what did he do? He just testified of what God did in his life. You don't need to be a, a preacher. You don't need to be a teacher, go to seminary to, to be able to share the gospel with somebody else. Just share what God did in your life. And God will do the rest. Don't worry about bringing conviction on their heart. The Holy Spirit will do that. You just do your job and let God do the rest. Amen? And it may not happen in a year or two. 
I, I've known a sister that she's 98 years old now, 92 years old now. And for years she prayed for her husband. Years. And never once did he want anything to do with the Lord. But you know what was, what was, what was my surprise a few months ago when I found out? That he got saved. After many years, and the first thing he did was grab his Bible, and God called him to prison ministry. He was an ex-gang member. So he's preaching in the prisons now. And she's about to go off with the Lord, and she's happy. Why? Because he has come to the Lord. She never stopped praying for him, but she left it in God's hand. Isn't that amazing? And Peter at that moment knew, this is what I need to do, Peter said. Now, the Bible says in verse 42, so after we see all this, verse 42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. I want to talk a little bit about this verse. What does it mean to continue steadfastly? What does it mean to continue in the apostles' doctrine? Why would they call it the apostles' doctrine? If if this word that we have here belongs to God, so how, how could it be that it belongs to the apostles? So there's, there's something there that we need to understand. But not only did they continue in the apostles' doctrine, they continued in fellowship. So why, why, why would the writer of the book of Acts write this? So there's three things we see, four things we see here. They continued steadfastly. They continued in the apostles' doctrine. They continued in fellowship. And that led them to continue in breaking of bread in prayer. Now, they continued steadfastly. So we're in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. And if you were to look up that word in Greek, continued, it means persevering. So if we were to read it the way that it was originally writ written in the, in the Greek, it would say that they persevered in the apostles' doctrine. So now when you're reading it in this way and you can understand it, you say, oh, okay, wait a minute. So it says that they were persevering. They were continuing to do something with intense effort. That's what the Greek definition of that word steadfastly means. It means persevering and doing it with an intense effort. There was a desire in them to continue in the apostles' doctrine or to persist in something. You know, I, I've always said this, and my wife and I talk about this, that uh, some people are born with talents and some people are not. But that doesn't mean that we're not all talented. It just takes being persistent. Continue to do it over and over and over, and you'll get it. It may take some five months. It may take some five years, but you'll get it. It's just about continuing to be persistent. And these men and women were persevering in the apostles' doctrine, and that word implies that the early church was devoted to the teachings of, of the apostles and in fellowship. They were devoted to this. And now let's talk about the apostles' doctrine. What does it mean to continue in the apostles' doctrine? We, we, we read this here, and we say, well, why would, why would the writer of Acts attribute these teachings to the apostles if they learned it from Jesus? And this is where some of the, uh, uh, the debaters against the Word of God come about and they say, well, you see, I told you so. Like a man told me years ago, he said, I just don't believe in the Bible. And I said, well, why don't you believe in the Bible? He said, because you ever played the game train? He said, you tell somebody something and then you tell somebody else and somebody, and by the time it gets to the last person, it's not even what you said in the beginning. And I was so young back then, and I remember thinking, I said, man, that's going to be tough to rebuttal him according to the word of God. But now we can understand that God's word has been preserved for us today. And there's so much substantial evidence within the scriptures and outside the scriptures of this. But the Bible says that they were continuing in the apostles' doctrine, but it was not that they continued in the words or ideas 
and thoughts of the apostles. Because if they would have continued in the words and ideas and thoughts of the apostles, then they would have continued following ideas and thoughts that were only man-made. Do you understand what I'm saying? You ever heard people say, they go, they go to church and say, well, the, the, because the pastor said so, I'm not going to do it. No, it's because the Bible teaches it. And even today, preaching here the word of God, your job as a follower of Christ is to go home and question and say, was he preaching really what the word of God says? I got to look this up and make sure for myself if what he's preaching is sound doctrine or not. That's our job. They were not continuing in the words or ideas and thoughts of the apostles, but it was the revealed word that they had received from Jesus Christ. You remember Jesus once said, even of himself, Jesus said, my doctrine or my teachings or what I teach is not mine. Even Jesus said that. He said, this ain't mine. He said, this is his that sent me. This is why Jesus even said at one time, he said, Father, don't let it be your will. Let it be my will. This is when he told uh, the, the apostles came to him after speaking to the Samaritan women, a woman, and they, they said to him, well, were you hungry? He said, I already ate. We said, who gave him to eat? He said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. So when the church in the New Testament is continuing in the uh, doctrine of the apostles, they are continuing in the revealed words that they had received from Jesus. Now, this is why today there's the office of apostle does not exist. We say, well, wait a minute, there's a bunch of people calling themselves apostles today. But that, that job is, is that, that office is, is done with. Because one of the main purposes to have been an apostle is that you were an eyewitness to the resurrection. Now, how many of us here saw Jesus resurrect? Raise your hand. None of us. And if I were to tell you that, why do you believe? What would be your response? Would you say, I believe because I saw the resurrection? Well, we haven't seen the resurrection. Hmm? Would you believe because of the scriptures that we read? Well, there's a lot of copies of manuscripts today. There's a lot of different translations. Why do we believe? Because we have placed our faith blindly. This is why Paul said, he said uh, in one occasion, in simple words, he said, well, I hope, he said, your patience, I hope you are patient with me in my folly. In other words, I hope that you're patient with me, even though you may think I'm crazy. He said, but I believe in Christ. And Jesus said, blessed are those that would believe in him. He's talking about us. Even not being present in the resurrection. Why do we believe? Because we know that we are not the same person we used to be. How many of you remember your life before you knew Jesus? Raise your hand. Huh? Before you knew him. We were totally different, but something took place in our lives. And what we see here is that they were continuing not just in the apostles' doctrine, but they were continuing in the revealed word that had been given to the apostles. And then guess what happened? That word was then given to the church fathers, and then the church fathers brought it about to, to we can say, uh, we'll, we'll go through a timeline, gave it to the reformers, and then from the reformers we see the, the Puritans, and then from the Puritans, the Anabaptists, and then the Anabaptists, and then we'll see the pilgrims, and then the pilgrims come here, and then we have the Quakers, and then the Baptists, and because we all come from Baptists, right? <laughs> the Christian Union were just a bunch of Baptists that had been kicked out of the Baptist church. And then they decided that God said, well, I'm going to use them to be church of God. But you see all that timeline, and it's not that we're following their words. We're following the revealed word that is given to us today. And we must understand that it was not, like I said, the apostles, but it was the teachings that were passed down to them by Jesus. And I'll leave you with this in this Sunday. A Bible scholar once said, the apostolic doctrine is not just a theory to be understood, but the word of God is a way of life to be lived out. We must live the word of God. We're going to reach this world with missions. It starts at home. Amen.
We talk about all these different ministries in the church. You know what's your number one ministry? Family. That's the number one ministry. It's family. And I know we can't. We All our family members are not going to accept the gospel. But we have to do the best we can to love them and to pray for them. We may not agree 100, but we're going to pray for them. That's our mission field. And it just spills over to what God is doing today. It's so very important. So we'll leave you here and we'll continue. This will, like I said, it'll give us a, an excuse to come back and to continue to talk about the importance of biblical fellowship. What we have here going on today and this morning, this is fellowship. This is where we come to encourage one another. This is where we come to share our faith one with another, to pour out our hearts to God. This is it. So if you, if you would rise with me, and I know my sister is going to play something here.